it's one o'clock. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us at today's Conversation Cafe event on greenhouse gases. Now, briefly, before we get into that, I just want to give a quick intro on MUSC sustainability. So MUSC sustainability or sustained MUSC's mission is to build healthy communities by inspiring and implementing solutions to environmental, social and economic challenges. And this is done through a variety of initiatives, including recycling and waste management, energy and water, food, transportation, climate and green building. So why are green greenhouse gases important? So to start, they, uh, as many people know, they trap heat in our atmosphere or carbon dioxide and methane. Um, this buildup of gases acts like a warming blanket around the globe and leads to longer term war warming, disrupting our climate on the planet. So as a prime example, when humans burn fossil fuels for energy, we add more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, thus thickening this blanket. Now I'm going to pass it to Christine. Thanks. So we wanted to just share a few of the greenhouse gas effects that um, are happening to Charleston right now. And this slide shows uh, a Charleston Harbor tide gauge, which has been collecting data from the 1950s all the way to today. And as you can see over time, um, the tides, they are getting higher. Um, they're exceeding seven feet mean low low water more often. And um, you know in the 50s you see a 2.7 event per year and in the 2010s now we have 42 events per year. And there was just an article in the Post and Courier last week about this and I believe the number was in the 60s. So the events per year going up and we see that next slide on our campus right and all around charleston so we've got ashley avenue here completely underwater from a rain event and that's Earhart street um, next to it on the top um, right and and that's from a hurricane event um, so as we have hurricanes coming along um, and if we had a high tide that was affected by climate change that was over seven feet, we're going to end up um, just like this picture on the upper right um, underwater, of course. And um, on the um, lower um, portion of this slide, we've got um, Haygood Avenue. You can see a vehicle um, attempting to go through that water. Um, I don't know if they made it. Uh, and you've got vehicles going through water right next to our children's emergency room and our adult ER. So um, this is uh, critical for our patients, our students and our staff. This is, that is why we're looking at greenhouse gases today. So to explain a little bit more about a greenhouse gas audit. So what this is, is an auditing process to report on our greenhouse gas emissions from MUSC as an enterprise. Um, we're using a software called SIMAP, Sustainability Indicator Management and Analysis Platform. This is a piece of software that's used by over 1,500 schools. And the reason we're doing this is, in part, it kind of started with the President's Climate Commitment, which was signed in 2007 by MUSC, which is an agreement you know, to recognize and act on climate change. Um, the last time an audit was performed like this was in 2015, and then this will be followed by um, this process will be followed by a climate action plan. So we're beginning climate action planning and this will be kind of in tandem with the city of Charleston and also the College of Charleston. Uh, to explain a little bit more, so all of the MUSC's emissions, the straight answer is no. It's not all the MUSC's emissions. We kind of have to have some measurement boundaries. Um, and so for this talk today, that will be the MUSC Charleston division. Uh, this is an image showing, you know, all different MUSC facilities and affiliate facilities across the entire state. So we're hoping to get there where we're measuring more of what is termed MUSC or affiliate MUSC, but right now we're staying with the Charleston division. Um, also, it's good to note that campus does change over time. So even within the Charleston division, we do have growth. Um, you know, as many of you know, we have new buildings popping up. We just had one this past year um, with Sean Jenkins. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is we're going to talk about gross measures and normalized measures. And the reason we're talking about those normalized measures 
are to account for some of those growth shifts. So whether it's more people on campus or new buildings or whatnot, that helps uh, basically just normalize that data so it's the same no matter what by dividing by, you know, whether it's per capita or dividing by square footage. And then also how these things are measured. So it's important to realize that while everyone uses you know, carbon emissions, a lot of times they mean greenhouse gas emissions in general. Um, and because there's multiple greenhouse gases besides carbon, carbon is kind of the principal one people think of. Um, but the idea here is to do an apples to apples approach where we have everything kind of standardized to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide equivalent, um, you'll often see that going forward in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And what that does is that takes things like methane, which you'll see um, that's listed at 30 global warming potential. So basically it means it's worth 30 carbon dioxide molecules. And then there's some things that are drastically more powerful in terms of their global warming potential, like refrigerants, which you'll see in the green and black molecule down there. And that has a 1500 global warming potential. So this audit takes all those and looks at all of them as carbon dioxide equivalents. Last piece of kind of information here for the introduction. Um, we're going to be talking about scopes. So this is kind of different from our measurement boundaries. These are three different scopes that we're looking at in terms of different types of greenhouse gas emissions that um, that MUSC has. So the one is like the most direct you could think of. This is when you are literally, you know, producing emissions on campus. So things like, um, you know, natural gas, fugitive emissions, things like running generators on campus stuff like that, um, chemicals and refrigerants, very direct things. Scope two deals with things that are less direct, um, but it's things that it's purchased electricity or purchased utilities and the carbon emissions associated with that. So if we purchase a bunch of kilowatt hours from Dominion or we use them, you know, we're not necessarily putting up those emissions as MUSC, but there were emissions associated with producing that electricity to begin with. So it tracks that. And then lastly, in the least direct is emissions as a result of the university's operations. So this is like tracking employee or student commuting to and from campus, directly financed travel. Um, we have things like study abroad and air travel or study abroad air travel in this category. We don't have any of that um, and we're not tracking everything that could be in this category. Um, some of that's just a limitation of bandwidth or you know, what we're actually measuring on campus. Um, but yeah, food, paper, things like that we're not tracking, but they're part of scope three. Um, there's just some realities of our ability to measure things. We are tracking solid waste and wastewater. So that's kind of what the different scopes are. Um, we're tracking kind of as much as we're able to within each scope. Some are easier than others. I'm going to pass it back to Christine for community data. So over time, you can see that our population is going up. We've increased by almost 5,000 people since 2007, and our budget has gone up, you know, over a million dollars. And our gross square footage is also going up. Um, so we've got all these um, indicators that um, are affecting the amount of greenhouse gases that we're producing. And um, the other indicators, cooling degree and heating degree days, those affect our greenhouse gases because the more cooling degree days that you have, um, the more cooling you will need in your buildings. So we're going to be using a lot more energy as the you know our climate warms, and and these numbers are showing the actual warming of our climate and the heating degree days of course inversely are going to go down because of that um, we're going to save a little fuel um, on the heating side but it's not going to make up for the um, fuel we're going to use on the cooling side so our total carbon emissions this is the big reveal right so um, we've got in 2007 181,000 um, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and um, on the um, right hand side 2019 we've gone down um, it's not a dramatic increase but it is in the right direction uh, to 4.13 percent that's a decrease of 4.13 percent from 2007 so we're happy to see that decrease and um, it just shows that we've got a lot of work to do 
in the Charleston region. Uh, we wanted to sort of give you a perspective of where we fit in. Uh, the citywide emissions here are over a million metric tons. The city of Charleston's just their operations alone are in the 28,000 metric tons. MUSC, of course, at the 173 and the College of Charleston at 49. So that just gives you an idea um, looking at other institutions that are um, close to us, surrounding us, um, of how we're doing um, or what our operation is producing compared to theirs. So um, emissions per capita, that is going in the right direction. Uh, so per person, we're going down. And the next slide also shows um, a reduction um, in emissions per gross square foot. So uh, both of these normalization graphs are showing um, us heading in the right direction. So we're happy about that. And then when we look at it um, as a comparison by scope, um, we're still seeing that you know, reduction. And this shows that our scope two emissions that purchased electricity, that's going down. And some of the reasons behind that we'll get into on other slides, um, but our scope one and our scope three are going up. Um, and our next slide sort of um, breaks that down a little bit more. So scope one, you can see we've got a 19% um, increase and that's showing that um, we're using more natural gas versus electricity. So, you know, our purchased electricity is going down and then um, our scope three has gone up 14%. So, um, and, and we'll definitely, we're, there's a slide um, that's going to show you that our waste has a lot to do with that. And it's the way we handled the waste or the way the waste was being handled in the community. Yeah, so um, here's uh, another way to look at it. Um, there's always just all kinds of different ways to split this apple, right? So um, we've got by source here. Um, our on-campus fuel use, that's of course that natural gas and, and that's in that scope um, one and it's gone up a little bit and it's showing again that the electricity is going down. Our commuting is going up and that's a, um, a because of population is what we think. Our, our population has increased. And there's something that's um, called T&D losses, that's transportation and distribution, and that has to do with the electricity. And it's when the electricity comes from the power plant to MUSC and we lose um, power through the lines, actually. It's just a way that the way the system works is not very efficient. All right, so comparison by type. Um, We've got the carbon dioxide. You can see we've had a pretty decent decrease there, and that is due to our energy usage going down. Um, a lot of our fuel use in the past was created by um, burning coal. And um, our fuel, our company, um, Dominion, and it used to be SCNG, they have closed um, several coal-fired power plants, and uh, that has helped um, reduce the amount of carbon that um, we're responsible for because we've used it. Uh, so that that's a good thing. And then the methane has gone up. That again is associated with the waste and we'll show you that on another graph. Our nitrogen has stayed pretty um, level. Uh, you know, things like fertilizer use. Um, we don't use as much nitrogen based fertilizer any longer. Uh, we're using more organic um, fertilizers on campus, so that's helping that number. Yeah, so um, just one thing to tack on to what Christine was saying, you know, I think looking at all this, it is good to think that like the campus has been slowly growing through all this. Um, actually from 2015 to 2019, it didn't slowly grow, it grew by 20% in population. So it's good to kind of keep that in reference um, when you, you're not seeing um, a normalization on there. Uh, so this is the carbon emissions profiles, very similar to what we were just looking at. Um, and you can see the different kind of sectors from 2007 to, 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 sorry, to 2019. Um, like we saw before in the purple, we're looking at just our electricity usage right here. Um, and that's the majority of our where our emissions come from. 
no matter what year, year we're looking at. Uh, then we also have in blue right here at 14.8 or 17.8. Um, that is on campus stationary, so that is diesel and gas usage on campus um, or you know, natural gas or propane. And then the other big, big piece of this is staff and student commuting, which you can see kind of in the bottom right um, in the light blue and pink. Um, that is staff or student commuting. Um, and so that's kind of a big factor that's kind of grown over the years. And then um, you can also see those transportation and distribution losses again, kind of in, uh, in another shade of blue <laughs> at 5.35% or 2.41%. And Christine covered that earlier. So now we're going to dive into some other major categories and not just describe our emissions, but also kind of delve into some of the data behind the emissions. Um, so to start, we'll get back to T&D losses in electricity. Yeah, so here this graph is showing you so many things. So the 9% of the orange is the T&D losses and the gray is the purchased electricity. So the 9% um, on 2007 and 6% 2011 and then 5% in 15 and 19. What that's showing us is that SCNG and now Dominion have um, they've done a lot over the years to make their system more efficient. That is not a, a, a track of how much purchased electricity we used. It's it's their system becoming more efficient. Now the purchases, like I said earlier, um, we have purchased less electricity. We are using less electricity and um, therefore saving dollars um, for MUSC in the state. And we're also saving greenhouse gases. And um, this graph is showing not only the fact that SCENG and Dominion um, did make their systems more efficient, but it's also showing um, that um, they use different types of fuel. So they stopped using the um, carbon-based fuel like the coal. Um, they're using more natural gas, which is still a carbon-based fuel, but it burns cleaner. So we've got lower greenhouse gas emissions due to efficiency, um, more efficient fuels, and the lower use on campus of energy. In 2009, we started a project called a performance energy project. And what that did was just change out light bulbs all, all over campus, more, more efficient light bulbs, more efficient fume hoods in our research labs. Um, we did projects on boilers and coolers and just a whole host of um, projects on campus that saved energy. And it looks like in 2011, you know, our, our, our emissions did go up and that shows the lag between the time we started the project and the time we finished the project. Uh, and um, and now we're coming back again in 2019, 2020. We've got another performance contract going on right now on campus. And, you know, what we're doing is changing out light bulbs again. We, we went from a higher efficiency complex for fluorescent light bulb to now a much higher efficiency LED bulb. So all those lights are being changed out again. It's going to pay for itself just like the first contract did. Um, we're also doing new projects on um, chillers and coolers. Um, we're going to set a temperature policy on campus and that is um, getting ready to be worked on right now. So um, all these things are going to reduce our energy use even more and we hope in the future to see this graph going down even more. So this is showing the other side of the coin, this is those scope one emissions, the distillate oil, number four, propane and natural gas. We use a fair amount of oil on campus in our boilers and our generators. Uh, when the boiler has, the boiler normally uses natural gas, um, but when we need to take it down for maintenance, we'll have to switch to oil. And if something were to happen um, with the natural gas being cut off, we'd have to switch to oil. 
Uh, so um, our generators use a fair amount of oil and we test those often. Um, we're testing those um, for safety reasons because if the power went out, we would have to switch to generator power immediately for the safety of our patients and staff. And um, the propane we use in forklifts and that we don't really use that much propane, but um, it is a part of our greenhouse gases. And then of course, like I said, the boilers, they're using the natural gas. And um, in the future, we, um, we'll see even more natural gas use, I believe in the future, um, because we're looking at something called um, cogeneration. And what that will do is um, we'll start making energy on campus from natural gas. And we'll use the waste heat from making it will natural gas will come into a um, engine it'll fire the engine the engine will create heat that waste heat will then boil water and that's a much more efficient system than what we're using now with buying the power from dominion um, so we'll be able to make power on campus and use the waste heat instead of natural gas to fire a boiler and it's much more efficient so our but our natural gas will go up but you'll see on the um, flip side our electricity will go down um, so it, it will help overall with our greenhouse gases great uh, so the next thing we're talking about very similar looking graph um commuting and then or sorry commuting emissions so this is both staff and student emissions together and you can see that's been pretty steady until 2015 where we saw a decent rise there um I think a lot of that, and I'll get into it a little bit more, is due to our populations on campus increasing a lot. Between 2015 and 2019, the campus um, population increased about 20%. So that is a big factor. You just have more people commuting. Um, the other factor is, you know, how they are commuting. Um, so this is the Carta Express data. This is showing how many people at MUSC are riding the Carta Express shuttles. Um, so that's average daily riders of the buses. Um, 2015 is right here in the middle. Um, this data is a little bit forward skewed compared to what you saw before. Um, then when we overlay them, you can see the uh, the CARTA data is at the bottom. There's a, a couple more data points here than we have for the emissions, but you can see a correlation between decreased CARTA usage or ridership and thus increased greenhouse gas emissions because it you know, more people are then in their cars, driving cars alone, which has a higher greenhouse gas footprint. Moving past commuting into solid waste. So this is showing the uh, four time points here, 07, 011, 15, and 19. I'm not sure if we said it, but we're using fiscal years for all of this data. Um, but we can see our solid waste emissions rising um, from 07 to 11. Um, we can pretty confidently say that's because we're no longer incinerating waste, which I'll get into um, with the incinerator uh, closing down. And then 11 through 19, we see that slowly rising. Um, I think a lot of that is just from campus growth and more people on campus, similar to the commuting. So I think if you were to normalize this data and look at it per capita or per gross square foot, you should probably see something more level. Um, and this is what I was talking about with the incinerator. And so this is just the way we handle our waste. This is our emissions from our waste. Um, but you can see that the incineration stopped. It actually stopped in 2010, so there's zero for 2011. And we had the landfill, CND, and compost, um, all increasing, but not at a super appreciable rate. Um, and so we think a lot of that, if you were to normalize by, you know, per capita, would be pretty flat. We'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, so that's kind of the main points here, and I'll turn it over to Christine for next steps. So um, just building off of what you were saying, John, you know, there's more to do, obviously. Um, we just finished this greenhouse gas audit within the last week, and we've put these slides together um, fairly quickly. Um, and we need to normalize the data. We need to crunch the data in various different ways to um, get more information out of it. Uh, we want to finalize the greenhouse gas audit and um, uh, 
we want to determine which year we want to use as a baseline. We've got data going back to 1999, but it's not um, all of the data like we just showed you. So we're going to have to determine which year is going to be the baseline year. Um, we also want to create a report based on all of this data. And um, in the long term, we want to expand the scope of the audit. You know, right now, we're just looking at the Charleston division of MUSC, but we have bought um, hospitals throughout the state and um, we'd like to expand the scope of this audit to those um, new facilities and in, in the other regions. And we want to standardize the data collection and reporting uh, so that um, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to get all of this data. And if we could standardize it and maybe um, maybe make it something to where it's easy for people to report um, on an annual basis. It would help with um, the labor it takes to um, get all of this data. And then once we've got all the data, we want to use it, right? And we want to um, create a climate action plan. So that is our next step. And um, we look forward to doing that in 2021 in conjunction with um, what the city of Charleston is doing and the College of Charleston. They're also looking at um, creating their climate action plan. So we're all sort of talking and helping each other and it's, it's, it's great to um, be in this together with the other entities. And then um, we're, we're doing all this, you know, to help with climate resilience. Uh, those pictures that we showed you earlier of all the flooding. Um, we've been doing all sorts of projects, um, completing them um, to mitigate and adapt to what's going on in the Charleston area. Uh, we've, like I mentioned, we've got the performance contract um, that will um, mitigate. Um, it will reduce our use of energy. Uh, the Cogen project is the same. Uh, we've got switch gear, we've got generator projects. Um, you know, all these projects are um, in some level of progress right now. And then we're going to um, make an addition to um, our basic science building. And that new um, addition will actually store water underground. It's our first major water retention project on campus and it'll store up to 55,000 gallons of water underground. It'll retain that water um, while it's raining and then once the rain stops and the system can, the stormwater system can handle that water, it'll just flow right out into the normal stormwater system instead of, you know, pooling on our sidewalks and in our streets. That's, this is the, um, this is what we're going to be doing in the future and how we're going to be doing things at MUSC. And then, you know, another ad adaptation project is to just get out of the way, right? So, um, if it's flooded, you'll be able to walk above it um, on elevated walkways. And um, we're looking at building a new elevated walkway uh, across Courtney um, down Dowdy Street. So um, lots of projects, lots to do. Um, and we're going to be reaching out to people on campus for help um, on all of these. And we definitely want to thank all of the people who were on campus who gave us data. Um, and that will all of their names will go into the report and um, we're just grateful to have such a great community to help us um, with this audit and the planning. Absolutely. There's plenty of people that I've been incessantly emailing and I want to thank <laughs> all of them and thank all of you today for listening and uh, being interested in this topic and for being continually engaged with what we do here. Um, also, I wanted to personally thank you. This is my one of my last couple of days here at MUSC. I'm, I'm moving on to another position, but I want to thank you for everyone that's been tuning into these on a monthly basis or near monthly basis. So thank you for that. And now before we turn it over for questions, I just want to tell you how you can get more involved. If you're not already, please sign up for our email list at musc.edu slash go green. Um, you can also follow us on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, speaking of YouTube, we do upload these talks that we have right here onto our YouTube channel, which you can find um, by looking up at USC Sustainability. And then last, I think there's video. one more slide too. Oh, there is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
So thank you, John Brooker, for everything that you've done. And uh, yeah, this is your last Conversation Cafe, and you will be missed greatly. Um, you've done so much at MUSC, you know, with our lab program and um, all the communications efforts and the events that you've put on. I just can't thank you enough for everything that you've done. Um, and I wish you luck in your next endeavor. And um, yeah, just come back anytime. <laughs> it, yeah, you. so um, thank you again. You surprised me with that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not to steal the limelight any longer. Um, thanks to everyone for listening to us and you know dealing with all those graphs. Um, but we wanted to open it up to questions. I haven't even looked at the chat panel yet. And uh, there is one person on here, Rachel. Um, what, um, Rachel is here. She that? is Whitbeck. She's um, on. She is one of the helpers. Uh, she actually was an intern in our office and is going to continue to be an intern in our office. And she helped with the greenhouse gas audit. So thank you, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rachel. All right. So should we get into some questions here? Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat box or if you raise your hand, I think I can make it so that you can talk to us face to face, screen to screen. Uh, so I think we might have answered Terry Lynn's question. She says, how does MUSC compare to other medical university enterprises in the mission? Seems like MUSC has lots more big, a lot more big machines, clinical equipment than say College of Charleston. That's definitely true. Christine, you want to take that? You want me to answer that? Yeah, it is. It's um, there's more work to do, Terry Lynn. Uh, that is, we want to normalize and and kind of see um, where we fit in with other um, colleges that are just like MUSC or very similar to MUSC, and and that is definitely something that's it's on our list of things to do. Yeah, I've been trying to find, you know, an equivalent organization to compare us to and it, it is hard because I think MUSC is somewhat unique. Um, there's a lot of organizations like Duke and other places that have, you know, kind of university hospital systems, but there's also usually an undergrad component and some other factors there that kind of make it hard to compare the two. Right. Right. And thank you, Terry. I will be going to work with conservation voters of South Carolina. I'll be staying here in Charleston, so I'll be around and I'll come swing by MUSC and say hi. So I think Terry Lynn has another question. Compared to UAB, there are several official comparative systems. She'll send us a list. Oh, okay. Thank you, cool. Terry Lynn. Takes thanks, a village, thanks. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Terry. And I know that um, in engineering and facilities, they do have a list of um, colleges and universities that they compare themselves to for other issues. And um, we'll definitely be taking a look at their list and, and you know, deciding whether that is um, a good thing, if those same entities are good to compare on this um, topic. Great. Actually, I see Susan Johnson on here. I'm going to put her on the spot. Susan, I'm curious, <laughs> who do you use for benchmarking in your initiatives if you have other similar, you know, universities or medical systems? That was a uh... A great presentation, really informative. Um, yeah, I would say um, in, in this arena, kind of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative and some of those organizations have been doing a really good job of tracking some of these metrics. Um, and I'm happy to dig a little bit deeper to see, you know, what would be considered our peer institutions and how they how they track. Because, I mean, I, we've had these conversations before, but I think if they're if they're looking at sustainability, they're looking at some of the things that I'm interested in as well. So, um, and and did I see that y'all had um, worked with a, I don't know if it was a consulting firm or, or I felt like I saw that in some recent newsletter. Um, on um, not on the greenhouse gases. That's okay. probably the performance contract. That was yeah. Amoresco. Okay, okay. But it, it relates and tracks and affects our greenhouse gases. Right. And yeah, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about a lot of it is related to Dominion and kind of the changes that they're making. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see over the next year or two as we see more um, of an emphasis and incentives 
to uh, address greenhouse gases and, um, you know, carbon neutrality, I think, is going to be um, more at the forefront than it has been previously. So it'll be interesting to track that and see how those changes affect our scores and how we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the Public Service Commission, you know, is getting their um, their plans for how they're going to use fuel in the future, and that is definitely going to affect us. Big time. <laughs> and John, we hate to see you go. We're going to miss you so much, and make sure you keep in touch, and let us know when you're back to live music and playing around town so we can come <laughs> see you. <laughs> Will do. Thanks, Susan. Sorry right. to put you on the spot. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. That was great. Great. We will definitely be working on this data some more, crunching it in different ways, coming up with, um, you know, new information out of the data that we can share. And as we get that, um, we will definitely update everyone. And, uh, you know, we just there's just so much to do here and it's going to take everyone on campus. You know, one of the things I've always said is I'm the sustainability manager, but I cannot make MUSC sustainable. It takes everyone. It takes everyone turning the light off or putting that can in the recycle bin or, you know, just reducing their um, commuting time or their commute, get on the bus, you know, it takes everyone doing that. So, um, you know, John was so important to that communication effort. Um, again, John, we're going to miss you. Um, so thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for coming on the call. Uh, we really appreciate it, your time today. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.